Going and asking for a government that is known for abusing these kind of regulations, governments that like power and control, um, very, very dangerous. And, and you know that if the government got their hands on AI technology, it's much more likely they would do harm than any private industry would do harm. What's your advice for someone who's young and motivated and wants to change the world and do something good for society? Well, stop wanting to want to do something good for society. Let's start with a big question. What makes us different from all the animals out there? Well, what makes us different is our capacity to reason, our capacity to abstract for abstract thought. Uh, the fact is that animals are perceptual beings. They can they can see and they can respond, um, and uh, but they cannot conceptualize. They cannot generalize. They cannot predict the future. They cannot predict different options. They can't weigh those different options. Uh, they can't change their environment in any significant ways, you know, with the exception of maybe beavers and and uh, and birds who create nests. They, you know, human beings built skyscrapers and we built computers and we can actually change. And and maybe what's behind much of that or, or, or essential features, the fact that human beings have free will and animals do not. Uh, human beings have the capacity to uh choose uh, you know to to use their reason to use their thinking capacity to use their rational mind or not and uh animals just respond to stimuli based on based on uh programming that is embedded in their in their genetic code so you reject the evolutionary psychology argument that humans just evolved to be in a particular bubble and cannot explain or understand certain things that are beyond their capabilities No, I mean, I don't know what human beings cannot explain or understand. Um, every time uh, somebody has assumed that we cannot know something, it, it turns out that later on we can. I don't think there are any metaphysical barriers for us to be able to understand things. Uh, I reject a lot of the evolutionary psychology. I don't reject evolution. So there's no question that um, the elements in the structure of our brain and and the way we are you know the way we are designed in a certain not designed but the way we are uh, biologically constructed and and exist is is determined by uh, by evolutionary processes the 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 great innovation that uh that evolution uh in a sense um, has with human beings is that It didn't have to design the entire code. It didn't have to have all the elements of the code in. So, uh, you know, we are we are self-programming beings. So we can actually design our own code. And, and that's a huge, from a survival perspective, a huge benefit. Because uh, if our environment changes, then we just need to figure out how to survive in a new environment. We don't have to wait Uh, multiple generations to evolve, uh, you know, genetic answers or not to evolve and therefore go extinct. We can actually solve problems. We can figure it out, and uh, and 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 we can survive in a variety of different environments. So as the environment changes, so it's a it's a massive leap forward in in uh, f from a evolutionary perspective where um, the the coding is done uh, through reason by by the rational being. Uh, in response to a changing environment, in response to an environment that now the human beings can actually change for their own benefit. A lot of people reject the notion of God, but stick with the morality that comes with religion. So yeah. with Christianity, it's obviously that of altruism and self-sacrifice. Quite a few people who are atheists still seem to be taking the morality of Christianity seriously. It's almost like rejecting God is the easy part, but rejecting moral the morality takes more effort. Why do you think that is? Why is it difficult to accept the morality of selfishness? Uh, I mean, partially because the, the Christians and and uh, the philosophers that have been influenced so much by Christianity uh, have been so effective in uh, in setting both in in. Um, Articulating the case for what they want for, for for this morality, but but more importantly, in making it seem like there is no alternative, right? Any any alternative is just dismissed offhand. It's not even considered. It's not even really thought through. Uh, so they position the world as you can either be an altruist, which means self sacrifice, which means uh, you know living for the sake of others, or 
you're lying, cheating, stealing, SOB. And there's really no alternative. And they can't comprehend an alternative uh, beyond that. And they've conditioned our thinking to think of the other. When it comes to morality, our mind automatically goes to, well, how do I treat other people? What about other people? So it's very hard for people to conceive of an alternative and, and, to, and, to, and to run it through. And then the other thing they've been very good at is, um, this is, you know, in a sense, separating morality from reason, separating morality from uh, morality from reality and and from values, uh, it, well, and from and from nature and from uh, from our, our own biology and from from the reality around us and our ability to think rationally. So that where do you get one morality? Well, if you can't get it from reason, then oh well, then and we can't get it from revelation because we're not mystics. Well, when our religious, maybe we still are mystics. So Plato certainly gets it from Revelation, even though he's not religious in in the conventional sense, but he's still a mystic. Um, so they still find different kind of mystical ways in which to derive their uh, uh, their morality. Or, um, well, it's just from society. You know, it's worked so far for humanity. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's why it's good. You know, we we've come this far. Let's just stick with the current uh, morality or, or take the, the Christian morality and tweak it a little bit, make it a little less offensive, and, and we can live with that. You know, somebody like, uh, you know, some of them try to come up with a reasoned um, approach to morality based on reason, but but they, they for whatever reason, they uh, limit themselves to a rational explanation for the Christian morality, for morality of altruism. Uh, they, they, they can't conceive of, they can, what Ryan's genius is, that she starts from scratch, that she says, why do we need morality? What's it for? And she doesn't just assume morality is what people say it is. She doesn't assume morality is how people behave, how, quote, good people behave. She doesn't, she asks the fundamental question, what do we need it for? Why do we need it? What is it? And she she builds from there, and therefore she can completely reconceive and or, or think of completely new um, a- approaches because she's not hemmed in by uh, you know by the conventional view of and and look it, it turns out that it takes a real genius to do that right so all these atheists are really really smart people but they're not geniuses. And it takes a real genius and somebody with an immense originality and honesty to be able to reject the status quo to such an extent as to basically formulate a, a, a completely new approach to morality from scratch. Yeah. Going on that, there seems to be a widely held assumption that inequality is bad. And if there's anything we can do to decrease inequality, we should do it. What's wrong with that assumption? Well, what's wrong with that assumption is, well, first, it's, it, it's, it's meaningless, right? What does inequality mean? Do you mean inequality of wealth, inequality of income, inequality of brain power, inequality of good looks, inequality of what, right? And, and so people throw out inequality without really defining it and without uh, talking about it. And, and, but, it. But there is an implicit assumption in that. And the implicit assumption in that is that there's some virtue to all of us being the same in some important categories. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that, that sameness is good and, and that just is mind boggling and, and silly. I mean, what is, what is so good about sameness? There's nothing good about sameness. Um, I- indeed, as, as we've seen, it is the division of labor. It is the fact that we have different values. It's the reason we trade because, because we, we have different estimates on the value of any particular thing. It's the reason we specialize and go into different fields. So, and, and that enhances human well being dramatically. Uh, we all have different values. We clearly all have different biologies and we have different, uh, you know, we grow up in different environments and we make different choices. So we're all fundamentally different. So there's this metaphysical fact that they're trying to reject of the fact that we're all different. And and so then, then they say, well, no, it's it, what we're really concerned about is inequality of um, wealth or, or income. And then, and then 
the question is, okay, but where does wealth and income come from? And why do you care so much? Why do you care so much about wealth and, in, 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 and income? And what they reject is the idea uh, that people create wealth and that income is something that's earned and i.e. deserved. Uh, you know, you saw this in, in Obama's famous speech, was it 2012 or 2014, where he said, you didn't build that. You know, businessmen didn't create what they created. It, you know, we're all in a sense in, in the speech, implicit and explicit, we're all creations of our environment, creations of our genes. You're not responsible for anything. And and that has a, a certain philosophical tradition, certainly going back to John Rawls, who said, you know, we're just products of our genes and our environment. And you're not responsible for your genes and environment. Therefore, you don't deserve anything you got. Because whatever you produce, whatever talents you have, they're not yours. They, they, they just happen, happen to land on you. In, 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 that's a weird formulation because they are yours. They are you, even if even if you got them from your your genes. Well, what are you? To logic, you to logic, then you are your genes. So they are you. But all of these theories, uh, you know, reject the idea that you, as a agent, as a uh, have free will and therefore have responsibility for your own successes and your own failures to a large extent. So, um, the, and therefore, you just don't deserve what you get because you're not responsible for it. You don't deserve what you get because um, it's, it's in a sense determined that you will get that anyway. It's deterministic. Um, and uh, you don't deserve what you get because we have this ideal of, of equality that, that you must be sacrificed towards, and that's altruism. So it's this combination of determinism, altruism, and collectivism. Uh, and and the inequality or the the worship of equality is kind of the culmination of all of that. It, it's the it's the integration of all of that into into this uh, egalitarian ideology that that it, it tries to tries to bring about some kind of uh, equality of outcome uh, among all of us. It's it's impossible to do without the use of physical force. It's impossible to do without violating uh, individual rights on a massive scale. Um, and it's impossible to do without restraining people's freedom and therefore their ability to create the wealth and prosperity that we all enjoy. What's your take on the growing doomerism surrounding artificial intelligence? All these otherwise smart people arguing for regulation and slowing down of progress in the field. I mean, in a sense, there's nothing new. Uh, the, 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 there's always been people who uh, have been uh, doomsayers around, about uh, growing technology. Uh, and uh, and so so in that sense, it's not new. What's new is the fact that the people leading the charge in the technology itself are the ones who are most skeptical about it, are the ones who are most doom and gloom about it. But essentially, all of this comes down to people not really understanding the nature of thinking and intelligence and reason and and the value added that it all provides, right? So, Let's say you could build a machine that became conscious and, and was smarter than all human beings. Well, that machine would want to trade with human beings because it would re realize other human beings have reason, they have values, I can produce values, they can produce values. There's a there's a there's a great interchange ability to interchange here and exchange. Um, so it, it, they don't understand reason, they don't understand trade, um, and then on top of that. They don't understand consciousness. I, I mean, machines are not going to be conscious. They're not going to be, you know, it's not like a machine will have values and goals. Um, and the the actual value added of artificial, what they call artificial intelligence is massive. I mean, basically, it is a way to dramatically increase the efficiency of, of the human mind, the efficiency, the, the ability of human beings to produce, the ability of human beings to, to create. I mean, if if much of the technological revolution or the industrial revolution has replaced muscle with machines, what AI has the potential of doing is taking certain uh, uh, tasks of the mind that are non-creative um, and replacing them with machines and then freeing the mind up, freeing individuals up to be to, to be engaged in those activities that, again, are, 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 we are, uh, you know, have a comparative advantage in doing, uh, creativity being one, uh, um, and, and of course, valuing machines don't value. So we have to provide the, the context in which machines are producing goods because 
why are they why would they want to produce the goods they they don't consume them so so it it they has to be they has to be they have to be value they have to be valuers and only human beings can value so no i mean look this in any technology there's dangers right you can you can you can run people over with a car you can cut people over with a knife um you can bomb people with an, with nuclear weapons but the question is who is in the best position to create safeguards so that technology is not used to abuse people and abuse rights. And I think the best people are the people who understand the technology the best. And those are the people within the industry. Those are the people who are building it. And if you look at, if you look at people like, like um, I forget his name now, the guy, the guy who was advocating, the guy who founded AI, uh, CEO of AI. Sam Altman. Open AI. What's that? Sam Altman. Sam Altman. I mean, these are smart, really smart guys. They're generally benevolent. They, they, he's not trying to take over the world and and uh, and destroy the planet or dis- destroy life on Earth. I trust him more than I trust a, a group of international global bureaucrats to to regulate things and to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, something bad doesn't happen. So, uh, look, I, I gave this example on the show I did the other day. It's you know in the biotech industry. You can you can cause a lot of harm, particularly now with gene splicing and with the, with our ability to change the genetic makeup of human beings even before birth. You, you can really do some crazy stuff and and build mon- you know create monsters and 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 hurt human life and hurt human ability. And scientists are not doing that not because there's government regulations, but because they got together and they said, look, the science is still young. We're not sure exactly what we're doing. We're still learning. Let's not do certain things. Let's let's figure it out as we go. Let's go slowly where it's dangerous, where we're not sure. And for the most part, they've done that. And, the, you know, the, the, without hurting uh, real scientific progress. Why can't the AI community get together and, and, and do the same thing uh, and, and basically set up like a, a group within the industry that says, here are the dangers, here are the things that we think we could go wrong. Let's make sure we don't do these things. Let's monitor each other uh, without giving away any trade secrets. Let's let's try to let's try to just just live up to to high ethical standards in terms of what we're doing, so we don't cause more harm than good. That's the way it should be done. Uh, people like Sam Altman are people that I would trust uh, engaged in something like that. But going and asking for a government that is known for abusing these kind of regulations, governments that like power and control. Um, very, very dangerous. And and you know that if the government got their hands on AI technology, it's much more likely they would do harm than any private industry would do harm. So funny you mentioned uh, trade and values because um, so there's AI and there's AGI, right? And artificial intelligence is basically like the chat GPT kind of stuff. And that's yeah. nowhere close to <clears throat> AGI. And yeah. I guess that also falls back to like a false understanding of epistemology or reason as you'd call it. And what I was, so like my best refutation of this is that, uh, have, have you heard of the paperclip maximizer argument? Like, uh, no, no. that's basically if we give the AI a goal that, uh, to turn, to make the maximum number of paperclips it can, then no. what it'll do is like, it'll even turn us humans into paperclips because, sure. uh, if that's its goal, it's just focused on that. But, so if it's an AI, artificially intelligent, if it's not AGI, then if it can do that, then we can just obviously plug it out, right? We won't yeah. let let it happen. But if it's an artificial general intelligence, then I don't think that it would be so focused on that one goal so as to make even humans paperclips. If it's smart enough to... Well, it depends what you mean, what we mean by artificial general intelligence. And, and it also depends it's, on whether that is even a possibility. That is, can you create general intelligence, um, you know, from from uh, from uh, electrons in a, in a, on silicone? It, you know, and it's, it's these are still, I am skeptical that you can create human-like intelligence on a chip. Uh, I, I think you have to have biology to create human-like intelligence. And indeed, Human-like intelligence cannot be separated from ability from ability to value, and and to ha- to be able to value, you have to be conscious, and uh, consciousness is a um, is a phenomenon of life, 
And therefore, to be able to be conscious, you have to be alive. Uh, so and we can't create life. We don't know how to create life yet. We haven't created life in a laboratory yet. Um, and you don't create life with silicone. You, you, As far as we know, the way to create life is with carbon. So there's still a lot of steps that need to be taken before we can get to, a, to human beings creating a life form that has intelligence similar to humans. And if we can, and that life form is a valuer, then we trade with it. And and if and, and that's great because it'll be able to provide us with fantastic services because it'll be super smart. And uh, we'll provide it with whatever it turns out it needs are, or, or its desire or, or its values are. Um, so, you know, I, this idea that reason somehow leads to a being that wants to turn human beings into paper clips. It, it just, right? And it's true that if it's a dumb machine and it's told turn everything into paper clips, it'll turn everything into paper clips. But, but that means it's dumb, right? That's by definition what dumbness is. It can't think beyond that. Uh, once it can think beyond that, and certainly once it can value, uh, why? Yeah, it would ask itself, why? Right. It would have its own morality, its own kind of understanding of the world. And maybe it would start with our values because we created them. And if we did, which is right now at least a far possibility, if we created them, then it would be like it's our child, you know, like another person. And they will certainly have our own values, like because they were the essential values, the moral values would be the same because the moral right. values are moral values for a living being with a consciousness and with free will and with reason. So if you create a being with reason, they would have um, they would have very similar values to to and, and the smarter they are, the easier it will be to show them that these are the two values. Do you think about alien civilizations at all? If there are people elsewhere, I, I don't. I, you know, I, I, I get it. Um, I like science fiction. I don't, but it seems like a waste of time to think about it because. Um, Either there are alien civilizations or there are no alien civilizations. It doesn't matter to my view of the world. It doesn't change anything about my life. If they show up, it might. It, that'll be interesting and fun. But as long as they don't show up, the speculation um, doesn't interest me that much other than if it's a part of a, a, a science fiction story. Wouldn't their success or demise also depend upon their ability to create wealth and their culture and whether it promotes or inhibits the growth of knowledge? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, 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 the, the specific biology will determine what constitutes wealth, maybe. Um, but, but yes, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not fearful of aliens coming here to enslave all people. If they're that advanced, they know slavery is no good. If they're that advanced, they would realize that the best way to deal with us is through trade. Um, and, and, uh, and yes, we can't maybe, you know, the whole point of comparative advantage is that you do, that that even if you're inferior to somebody else um, in your ability to produce, then producing everything doesn't make any sense if you can produce some of it, right? If you can produce something, even if you're inferior in that one thing, it's they should focus on the things that they have a the largest advantages, and let you produce the things that you have uh, that you that, that it, where they have the smallest advantage and and. Everybody's everybody benefits when that happens, and that's true with aliens as well as it is with other countries or other individuals. What are some popular movies besides Avatar that you deeply philosophically disagree with? We can actually add books to that same question: fiction or nonfiction. Oh, questions like this where I have to where I have to dig into my memory are really really hard for me. I mean, there are very few movies that have a good philosophy. Most movies have bad philosophies. Um, you know, think about the the explicit altruism in in uh, in a lot of the superhero movies, uh, the duty premise that they have in terms of saving the world or saving civilization or saving this person, the commandment "I shall not kill" that I don't know what is it Superman or Batman or somebody uh, has to live by even even as people are being slaughtered left and right by the bad guys. Um, so, so uh, you know, most movies have at their core some kind of bad philosophy. It's rare to find a movie where you can say, "Yeah, that right on." It's or, or think of uh, um, 
Game of Thrones, right? Game of Thrones is a good example. It's a, it was a huge hit, very, very popular in the culture. But what is it about? It's about power. It's about force. It's about, uh, it's about, it, it, they know it's not about values. It's, it's kind of intriguing to see the whole story is about the, how force is being used. And the, the only alternative is to use force. There's no alternative to force. The only way to gain the Iron Throne is, is through the use of force. And then you just see the different characters using force in different ways. Um, it's a, a you know, doggy dog world. It's a zero sum world. It's not a, it's not an even, so even when you have a character who, who is freeing the slaves and views has some positive view in the end of the day, when she needs to, when, he, when, 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 when she gains power, she's going to rule and, and she's going to enslave all of us. So, um, you know, but that, that comes from a recognition maybe that force is bad, but with no alternative, no idea of what alternative there is. And, and in that sense, there are no real heroes in the show because, it can't conceive of a hero. It, it it can't think of what that would look like, what that would be. So I can't really, it, it's very hard to find a show that doesn't have some element of altruism or collectivism or uh, subjective epistemology or a lack of understanding of the role of the mind or, you know, something like that. So um, one has to find whatever good there is in the movies that exist and not, worry not worry too much about that you know some movies are so bad philosophically like avatar that's just not worth watching in my view but most movies are mixed and you've got to enjoy the good parts and and uh and and live with that what do you think about the current education system oh yeah i mean it's awful <laughs> i mean it's easy um it's awful it 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 there's there's it's uh it, it's not an educational system that promotes thinking uh, it's not an education system that that helps us or, 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 or helps us gain the skill of thinking or teaches us how to think. And it's also not an educational system that teaches us facts about the world. So it defaults on both of the main responsibilities of educational system, train us and teach us how to use the tool that we have, our, our mental capacity, and teach us about the facts as they're known today about the world out there, which which we need to we need to have. Um, you know, it, it, it the educational system um, it either teaches us dogmas that we have to memorize or we have to buy into, or it teaches us that our emotions are more important than using our mind and, and reasoning through problems. And uh, it teaches us, to, at least to some extent, that facts are subjective, that who knows what the truth is, and and uh, uh, history is, you know, is is uh, is an issue of perspective and. Um, and don't take it too seriously, and generally don't take knowledge or thinking too seriously. All of that, I think, is what is projected by the educational system, uh, and and it's uh, the consequence are, in a sense, a dumbing down of uh, of, uh, of of people, Americans, uh, or really any educational system. Some are better than others, but none are, are good. And and what you what we don't have is real competition in education and real. A real competition in, in people proposing different ways to do education right and to do education well. Uh, and we don't even have really a discussion about what are the what are the standards by which we would measure what a good educational system is and what a bad educational system is. So there's a lot of work to be done in education. There's some people doing good work in education, but there's a lot of work to be done in education to kind of unpackage all that and figure out and figure out kind of an ideal or or, or better system. I saw in a video of you talking a little bit about the beginning of Infinity, the book by David Deutsch. Yeah. yeah. And you say his epistemology just keeps missing and that you wish someone would give him to read Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. I'd yeah, love to talk to help. you. Yeah. I'd love to talk to you about that because I think Ayn Rand is awesome and she has a powerful defense of capitalism and the critique of altruism. Yeah. Philosophy is just so inspiring and pro-progress. But yeah. I fundamentally disagree with her epistemology and uh, I had your friend and colleague, Don Watkins, on this podcast, and we talked yeah. a little bit about Rand's epistemology, but I didn't find it very convincing. So I very much inclined towards the epistemology explained by Karl Popper first and improved upon by David Deutsch in his books. So to start with, maybe, what do you think about the beginning of infinity? Yeah, so my response, my reaction to the beginning of infinity is similar to you, Stein Rand. I mean, I like, I love what David Deutsch has to say about progress. And I, I love um, 
um, uh, his his confidence and optimism and in human you know in human beings and ability um, to change the to change our environment and to improve our environment um, and and to manipulate if you will the atoms in the world to to constantly make them make life better and and make the universe different um, and his epistemology is completely screwed up and it's completely messed up and it makes absolutely zero sense. And, um, you know, I, I find that, and I think that, of course, that comes from Papa. I think Papa is, is completely wrong. And David Deutsch is a lot better than Papa, I think, primarily because he has a much better view of progress and humanity. And, and I think Papa is much more mixed in that sense, and, and Deutsch is much better. Um, but, yeah, it, it, the epistemology is completely screwed up. And, and it's it's mind-boggling to me reading um the, reading the book because basically it, 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 I, and I can't and I don't have the book in front of me so I don't have the the, the, the exact sections but basically it, it, the, the, these massive contradictions where it, it, the epistemology is completely tripping him up he's, he's making this argument about a human progress that requires Rand's epistemology and he's advocating an epistemology that in a sense is the exact opposite which undermines his whole argument about progress so um it, it, it's and it, it's yeah so it's 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 so it was so frustrating to read that book there were chapters that were wow you know he he makes he makes the best argument possible for uh, most inspiring argument and then and then the next chapter is like what the hell what what's he talking about he doesn't know what he's talking about. what do you think is fundamentally wrong with Deutsch's epistemology well the fundamental problem is that he doesn't start with reality he doesn't start with facts. He doesn't start with evidence. Uh, and so he doesn't start with human senses. He 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 starts with Plato. He start who supposedly rejects, but he supposed, starts with Plato. He starts with, uh, you know, I think therefore I am. He starts inside his own mind. And there's nothing inside his own mind. There's zero inside his own mind until he uses his senses to gain facts about the world out there. So the beginning point in epistemology, the beginning point in thinking, the beginning point in uh, you know cognition has to be what's out there, identification, identifying what exists in the world. And only then can you think. There's just no thinking that can happen before then. It's there's a there's a tool with no content, but the content comes from outside. The content, you're not born with content, you're born with the tool. Do you think there's no sort of inborn knowledge that we possess when we start out? No, there's no thin bone. I, I don't know what thin bone knowledge is, but but there's no knowledge. So I don't know what thin or thick bone knowledge. Is. There's no knowledge. In, uh, so like what you have as a tool, you have senses and you have a tool that integrates the information that comes from those senses and integrates them. So you have a tool and you could argue that the thin bone knowledge is the, 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 the um, oh God, the uh, ability of the tool to do what it does. Right, the the mechanism by which the the rules that the tool functions by, if you will, I don't. Th but that's not knowledge. That's just that's the mechanism by which the tool has to function. There's just no other way. But but it, it it's taking the evidence that is received by the senses, integrating them, and and that's where facts and knowledge comes from. And until you have that, you have nothing. And there's no. It's not an accident that babies know nothing. They, they they know nothing they can they can suck basically and they can cry and they can poop and that's it having had some I, I I'll tell you they know nothing and then as they start looking around the world as they start gaining information gaining data from the world integrating that data I mean one of the amazing thing about having babies is that you can see Ayn Rand's epistemology in action as they form concepts I mean to me Rand's epistemology was, you know, proven empirically, you know, just by watching children and how how they how they form concepts and how they act and how they integrate, and it's it's right there that you you can see it in action. So you you get the data, and then you start integrating. You see similarities and you see differences between. First you see differences and then you see similarities between things, and that allows you to integrate those into abstractions. And and then you then you can start thinking abstractly, but until you find those first abstractions, fund the data that comes in, you can't think abstractly. So everything starts with observation. Everything, 
And that observation could be in in very sophisticated science can be very, can be indirect, right? Uh, could be using a microscope or, or ultimately using observation uh, using math that explains that is based on certain observations that are at a high, at a different level. But at the end of the day, it all starts out there, and only then can you observe. First, you have to observe the phenomena of gravity before you can have a theory about gravity. First, you have to drop bottles, lots of bottles. And you know, children do that. They'll take a thing and they'll let it go. And then you'll pick it up and you'll give it to them and they'll drop it again. And 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 what are they learning here? They're learning causality. They're learning about gravity. They're learning how they can manipulate their parents, which is causality, right? Um, but they are learning through experimentation. They're learning through trying something and saying, oh, let's try it again. Oh, and now I come up with a generalization. Ah. That's what it is. Let me let me let me make sure the generalization actually works. I'll drop it a few more times, right? So they're inducing. Induction is the the only way in which we gain new knowledge. There is no new knowledge outside of uh, ultimately outside of induction. So uh, we induce, and then we deduce from those inductions. But to 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 eliminate induction from human knowledge, is, from human reason, is to eliminate knowledge from human reason. We don't know anything in that case. Let me try and put forward a pithy version of Popper's epistemology or uh, Deutsch, which Deutsch improves upon. So observation is not a source of knowledge. You cannot observe the facts of reality, quote unquote. The purpose of observation here is to test our theories. For Where do theories come from? Theories come from the mind. They're conjectured. So so babies have theories. They just pop pop up theories and then they, they test those theories. And they so, just, they're just conjected by a baby. A, a two-year-old conjectures a theory. When, so yes, when you sit, when you reject like inborn knowledge, uh, I would say that we have a lot of inborn knowledge, and some of like even sucking, uh, even sucking is like sucking mother's milk is a part of your inborn knowledge. After a while, we not knowledge. It's a it's a reflex. It's a muscular reflex. If I put my finger in a baby's mouth, it'll start sucking it. It it's not. I need to suck in order to eat, and therefore I need to find the nipple because there's milk there. It's put something in my mouth, I'll suck because it's a reflex. It's 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 a it's 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 a it's a, it, 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 there's no cognition, there's no mind that's involved in the sucking. Why does it then? Uh, why do we not have that sucking reflex after uh, a year or so? Well, because because one of the things that happens uh, with human beings is as we gain uh, as we gain conceptual knowledge, as we gain practice in a sense, we override the 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 instincts. So the sucking thing is still there, but it, it 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 stops being because wait a minute, I don't need to suck; I can now chew. So I don't need to suck. Stop sucking, okay? So I can stop sucking. So we actually override, but the only way we can override it is by gaining concrete factual information about the world one of those factual informations we gain is hmm i can chew my food in a sense right I, we, they don't literally think that but they experience the chewing of the food and that results in new knowledge about how to gain how, how, you know in in uh, uh, regarding the fact that they don't need to suck anymore so they stop i think i agree with that but so 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 everything so everything starts with you open your eyes you see stuff and it, there, there's the facts of reality. There's reality. And your mind, your mind is not passive. Your mind is integrating. It's working with the stuff. And in that sense, there's, you know, in a sense, thin knowledge, you know, in that sense. But all the facts come to the outside. There's no, there's no factual information. And if there is factual information inside, where did it come from? Uh, so... L looking you at know, we're not mystics, right? <laughs> Deutsch is not a mystic. So where did the factual where did the factual knowledge come from? Where did all these facts come from that you're born with? So I, I don't. Uh, we looked at the night sky for thousands of years before understanding what stars actually are. And yeah, we, we yeah people we saw, their... So so we so we so we. It's true. We we came up with the hypothesis that were wrong, like, like the lights, the gods, the whatever. But we started with an observation. The observation is the night sky. The observation is light in the sky that kind of moves a little bit here and there. And then we came up with a hypothesis. Maybe it's gods. 
we didn't have any way to test it. So we stuck with that hypothesis and then maybe other people came. But we started with an observation. So every hypothesis, every single hypothesis that is that has any kind of legitimacy starts with an observation. The hypothesis might be wrong and it needs to be tested. I'm, I'm for hypotheses and testing. But you cannot hypothesize without observation. And when you do, you come up with crazy theories in physics, as I think David Deutsch does, um, crazy theories in physics that have no reality. String theory and and uh, and what is it? Multiverse, uh, multiverses are just one example of, I think, crazy theories that have no reality, that mean nothing. Uh, that are detached from everything, and it's because they they start in here and they're not connected to anything out there. And of course, they're not testable. Yeah, I don't think a podcast is the best way, the best format to have this kind of clash of ideas because there's other obligations as well. But I still want us both to put forth our stances. We should definitely continue this conversation because I do think there can be a fruitful meeting of minds between. Um, objectivists and critical rationalists, because we both care deeply about progress, individuality and freedom. Mm -hmm. And so there could be a fruitful discussion there about epistemology as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I agree. Anyway, the final question I wanted to ask you is, what's your advice for someone who's young and motivated, let's say out of high school and wants to change the world and do something good for society? Well, stop wanting to want to do something good for society. Um, you know, why do you want to do something good for society? So start with, start with identifying your own values and start with wanting to do something good for yourself and wanting to live the best life that you can live. Maybe at the end of the day, that involves, that'll probably involve something that society benefits from society, depending on which society, you know, do you want to benefit Russian society? Do you want to fit Iranian society? Um, do you want to benefit Putin or do you want to benefit, you know, David Deutsch or world full of David Deutsches? Who do you want to benefit? So I, I, the whole try to get away from these notions of society and and mankind and all this stuff and 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 think in terms of a specific, you know, narrow it down to what kind of human beings you want to actually help and figure out why you want to help them. And and have a have a real perspective in terms of your own values and your own life and your own well-being. What do I want to do and why do I want to do it? So I would start there. Figure out what what really makes you what you really enjoy doing, what is really valuable to you. Um, and uh, you know, and I and I th and it could be it could be science, it could be philosophy, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, and and your duty. You don't have a duty to society. You, if you have a duty, it's to yourself. And and so so start. You, you know the, that is, I think, the starting point. Um, I, you know, I recommend everybody read Rand because I think, uh, particularly for the for the ethics, particularly for the morality, uh, I think I think it's crucial. Although the morality depends very much on the epistemology, um, I, I don't think it stands alone. So I'd encourage I encourage any young person to study Ayn Rand. And then figure out what uh, what are that individual's real, you know, values. What 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 are, what is what is really important to you, um, and and really dedicate yourself to, to to pursuing them and and not not compromising with them, um, and taking risks. I mean, one of the things that I think is a real problem in the world is is when people become so risk averse that they 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 tend to be afraid and they tend to be passive and they. Uh, they they don't engage with the world and they don't engage with their own values and they don't pursue them uh, aggressively enough. Yaron, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.